everybody to the call again tonight. This is the 2014 Indiana Artisan Marketplace webinar series presented by Indiana Artisans for Indiana Artisans. Our call topic tonight is using Etsy, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to promote your work. We've got a lot of people on the phones and a lot of people listening on the webcast. Just to let everybody on the phones know, um, we will be taking questions throughout the night. If you have a question, go ahead and write it down, and then in between each speaker, uh, we're going to try and open up the lines so that you can ask your question. The way to do that is to press star 2, star 2, to raise your hand, and I'll open up your line. And that way we can keep the background noise to a minimum. If you're listening on the webcast, there's a uh, box in the bottom left-hand corner where you can submit your question. All you want to do is then type in your question, and you can do this any time during the call tonight, um, and you just click that and submit it. Those will line up for us, and then when we open up the call for questions in between speakers, we can read those questions and try and answer those. And then I think if we have time at the back end, We'll open up the lines again after everybody's done for uh, any general questions that we have. And so that's the way to get started. Again, if you're listening on the webcast and you've got the slides open on your computer, there's a button at the bottom where you can sync up with the webcast. Otherwise, there's going to be a six-second delay. If you're listening on the phone, click the button that says sync up with a phone and that way you can hear us live without the delay. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And I want to introduce everybody tonight. And uh, I think, Eric, you're going to take over the call. Eric Freeman, the Indiana Artisan Director. Eric, welcome to the call. Jeff, thanks. i got a couple welcomes I want to do. I want to welcome, the uh, again, the applicants to Indiana Artisan. Uh, we, they, we invited them to join us last week, and we went ahead and invited them to join us for the entire series. The art jury panel meets next week, and the food jury panel meets the first week in February. All the applications are in, and so those applicants have been invited to join us tonight, so I wanted to welcome them. I also want to welcome the Kentucky Crafted and Kentucky Proud participants in the marketplace. Uh, this series is so good, and since one of the goals is to help artisans prepare for the marketplace, it made sense to invite our artists and foodist friends from Kentucky to join us. So welcome to those people who want to dial in. I have seen the slide deck that these three speakers have put together that you're going to see tonight, and we all are going to learn a lot. I don't know what they're going to say, but just in reading their slides, I learned a lot over the course of the last couple of days. So I think we're going to get a lot out of this tonight. Jeff already uh, introduced the speakers, but just real quickly, in, in the order they're going to speak, we have Megan Wynn from Indianapolis, who owns The Binding Bee. Megan makes leather-covered and embellished handmade journals. Uh, Julie Bolajak, who's uh, based out of Shelbyville, but does most of her work in Indianapolis. She owns Chocolate for the Spirit. She's a chocolatier that makes truffles, chocolate bars, and, and a lot of other chocolate candies. Uh, and then Carrie Abbott will talk last. She's from Indianapolis. She owns Newfangled Confections, the maker of Frittle and other handcrafted candy. Megan is going to start, and she's going to talk about Etsy, which is the uh, e-commerce site where people around the world connect to buy and sell unique work. Uh, Etsy is different than the social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So Megan will focus just on Etsy. Then we'll go to Julie, who's going to talk about Facebook and how it's changing and how it's uh, not as easy as it used to be for those uh, to, who like your Facebook page to see your posts. I, I learned that, Julie. That was something that was news to me. So I think everybody's going to be eager to hear that. And then Carrie will cover Twitter and Instagram. Instagram is kind of the new kid on the block. It's a photo and video sharing site for your business, and Carrie will talk about that. So without further ado, Megan, are you ready to start us off? I'm ready. All right, take it away. All right, excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, very excited to be here this evening. I am kind of new to Indiana Artisan. The last marketplace was my first one. I had started in the fall before, so I'm very excited to be here. I had to work really hard to get into the program, as Eric knows. I applied uh, quite a few times before finally getting in, so I feel extra um, proud to get to be a part of such a good group of people. So my topic for this evening is how to use Etsy to promote your work. Um, and like Eric said, I'll, I'll go through and explain everything that Etsy is, but a little background. I have been selling on Etsy for five years. Uh, when I first started my company, this was kind of the very first way that I dipped my toes into the pool as far as selling things before I even did a craft show. Um, I had an Etsy site and was kind of practicing marketing myself through that. So we can go to the next slide. 
um, the What is Etsy slide. Etsy is an online marketplace that sells handmade goods, vintage items, and craft supplies. I'm assuming that a lot of people have probably heard of it by now. It's, it's gotten some notoriety in the past few years, um, and people who are in art markets, I feel like, have at least, have at least heard it mentioned. The, but the website is Etsy.com. And what I'm going to focus on tonight for Etsy is the fact that it's a really, really easy way to have an online store. That's what brought me to Etsy, and that's why I continue to use it. Um, and for the purpose of Indiana artisan participants, this is the angle I feel like that's the most helpful. Um, so I know I was kind of going through the Indiana artisan website today and pulling out different people just to kind of see who's on Etsy and who's not. And I found about a dozen um, who have Etsy sites. Some of them look more active than others. Um, but for those of you that already have Etsy sites, this uh, conversation tonight might not be quite as helpful because I'm not going to go super in-depth about how to really go gangbusters on the site. It's more just an introduction and um, ways that I feel like the Indiana artisan community can, you know, can will value it. So the next slide. Um, this is who I think would benefit from using Etsy. And the number one group is artisans who do not have a website. Hopefully, most of you have a website. Um, I know I saw a few people that use Facebook as their website or have a flash page with a phone number. Um, and that's all fine and good. But if you, if you don't have a way for consumers to purchase things over the internet and you are someone who sells straight to consumers and your business isn't just wholesale, um, then you're leaving a lot of potential sales on the table by not letting people have access to you online. So Etsy can be a really, really big benefit to people who um, don't have a website. And then the next group is people who have a website but not an online store. And I fall into this category. I have a beautiful website that a local designer did for me. But at the time that I had the site built, I didn't have the funds to put a shopping cart in there. So I used Etsy so that anytime anybody wants a leather journal from Bind and Bee, they can go and buy one online. So my, my site never closes. My shop never closes. Even when I'm on holiday, I can still be making sales. Um, and then the third group is artisans interested in reaching new potential customers. And I'm not going to focus on this one quite as much, because if you have a web store and a website and you sell your things straight through your website, I think that's kind of the most, like, that's the best way to do it, in my opinion. Um, so Etsy could be beneficial if you're just wanting to tap a few more potential markets. Um, but the thought of running two online stores is a little mind-boggling for me, so I don't necessarily recommend people do it unless they really want to. So I'm, I'm mainly focusing on the first two groups artists who don't have a website and who have a website but not a store. And then the next slide, why I use Etsy. Um, Etsy, my, my main customer shops on Etsy. So for me, it's really amazing because I'm getting connected with a lot of people who are wanting to purchase my, my thing. I sell leather-bound books, which is what I juried into Indiana Artisan with. And then I also sell a lot of wedding things. And there's a lot of people on Etsy who are looking for unique custom items. And so I sell a lot of custom work on there. Um, the second, and probably the most important, is that it's very easy and affordable. Anyone can open an Etsy site. It, it takes five minutes, and you can get your pictures up and your listings, and um, it's easy to manage. It's very, very simple, and there's a lot of instructions on there as to how to do everything. Um, Etsy has a very good brand. They're very well recognized at this point. When I first started doing shows, um, you know, five five years ago, maybe one out of ten people would have heard of Etsy, um, and a lot of people would just be like, "Oh, Etsy? Like, what? What are you talking about?" And so, you know, now five years later, almost everyone that I interact with at a show not only knows about Etsy, but gets really excited that they're meeting someone who has a store on Etsy, and you know, their friend has a store on Etsy, and they bought all of these things on Etsy. So. The name has a lot of recognition, and it does bring some credibility to um, to you that you've got a store on Etsy. Even though anyone can do it, it kind of seems counterintuitive, but people still get really excited when they hear you have one. Um, another thing which totally relates to everything that the other two speakers are going to be talking about this evening is that Etsy is very integrated with the other social media sites. It's very easy to share. Twitter, um, Facebook, Pinterest, it's all integrated. They do all the hard work for you, so you just a couple clicks of a button and you've promoted your item. Um, another huge one is that there are millions of visitors that visit Etsy every day. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that my little corner of Etsy gets a million eyeballs in front of it. But the fact that there's such a big funnel coming into this one website gives me a bigger chance of, of reaching people rather than just being Googled or you know people looking things up on just a search engine. Um, oh, I'm talking too fast. I'm running out of breath. OK. The next one is international reach. Um, I actually just shipped something to Australia today that I sold on Etsy. And I guarantee that that woman did not see me at a craft or an art show in the Midwest. So that is exciting to get those international orders and people finding you. Um, one of the biggest reasons that I use Etsy and would also encourage other artisans to use it is because that it integrates with a shopping cart. It works as this is the way I sell my work online. It works right on my .com, and people can, like I said, purchase anytime they want. Um, it's very, very easy to ship. It's connected to USPS, and I can print my labels out and pay right there. And they also do a lot of tracking. So it's almost like you have your own personal Google Analytics that's just showing you everything that's happening on your page, um, what countries people are coming from, how many people click on what link. It's, it's a whole gold mine of information. So OK, that was a lot of talking. And I'm going to show you some images now. We're all very visual people as artisans. Um, the next slide is this is just a little picture of what my Etsy store looks like. So Etsy.com is the big marketplace, and then this is my little corner of Etsy. Um, and you can see right under my logo, the binding B, there's a little picture of me, and it says switch. And then um, there's another the little Twitter thing to follow. So it's very easy for people who are looking at my site to link up with my Facebook, my business Facebook, and my business Twitter. Um, on the left-hand side, where it says shop owner, it's got my name, the city that I'm from, which really does matter. People love to know where you're from. And they really love to shop local. Um, I'll, I'll have someone in California find me and say, oh my gosh, I grew up in Indianapolis. I'm so excited to be supporting someone from there. Um, and then they can also request custom orders or send me an email through Etsy. And then any of these pictures, click on, and they can purchase that journal right there. I don't have to worry about the credit card. Etsy takes care of all the back end. Pretty amazing. OK. So I'm going to walk you through how I personally use Etsy. And this is the model I was talking about as far as I, um, I have a .com, but I don't have a shopping cart on my website. So I'm going to show you how my web designer and I got it, got it going. So the next slide is this is a screenshot of my website, bindingb.com. And you can see here I have all my social media stuff, my mailing list, and then people can go through any of my tabs. But if they click on the shop link, which is second from the left, um, it's going to pull up this next page. And so you see it looks like it's just integrated right into my website. You can't necessarily tell quite yet that it's a third party. Um, so people can click through underneath where it says journals. They can click on any of these images and check out straight away. <coughs> OK. So then the next slide is when they click on one of those photos, they're directed to my Etsy site. And this is where they push the green button, add to cart. I get all the shipping information and can Get it in the mail. Um, OK. And then social media sharing. I'm going to show you how that works very quickly, too. This is a close-up shot of one of my listings. And you see the little thing that it says favorite. People can favorite it. And that just is within Etsy. They're collecting it so they can find it later. And then it's got the Twitter button, the Pinterest button, and the Like button. So anyone, there's 17 people who have liked that on Facebook, that's going to show up on their news feed to all of their followers my Binding Bee product, and a link to my website. Same with if they do it on Twitter. Pinterest is amazing, and we probably should have a webinar just about using that. Um, but Pinterest is the same thing. They're going to put it on their social news feed, and then all their followers are going to get to see my work. OK, and then the next slide, I, I don't rely on other people to do my marketing, even though it really does help when they share it with their friends. Um, and it goes natural without me having to pay for it. But the other thing that I do is I take all of my listings straight off of Etsy, and I put them on my Facebook page. And I don't do them all at once, because I don't want to overwhelm people. But this is just you know, a few times a week or around Christmas I did this more frequently. And at first I was kind of um, hesitant, and I thought it might be a little hokey. And then I posted one, just this pretty, very unique book. And eight minutes later, it had been sold to a woman in Florida who had seen a friend of hers like it on Facebook and had gone straight from the link that I put in my page onto my Etsy site and bought it for Christmas. 
So that convinced me that there is a lot of value to these things. Um, and it was really quick, too. So this is just another way that you can, you can use as a to integrate with social marketing. If you have your own .com and you have all of your items listed, you can do the exact same thing. We're just taking links and doing it the same way. Um, but for people who don't, it's a really good way to get started selling. Okay, and then the downsides of Etsy, because i got to be honest, there are, there are some. Um, the site's incredibly crowded, and new people open stores every day with a whole lot of new stuff, and so um, it, there's just a lot of people on there, which does get a lot of eyes on the site, but it also can feel kind of crowded. There are a lot of buy sell vendors. It's not a juried website, which means anybody can be on there, and they don't actually do a very good job of policing it. So even though kind of the mission that they set out for was more handcrafted, anyone can be on there. Like I said, anyone can have an Etsy shop, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest downfalls and the reasons that it's best to have your own shopping cart, but like I said, I don't, um, is that customers have to create an Etsy account to make a purchase. Like I walked you through the three stages from my website. Sometimes that's just annoying to have one more thing to do. Um, and I know as someone who buys a lot of stuff online, I want it to be as simple and efficient as possible. Um, the last one is that it is easy to get overlooked on Etsy. If you were to go to Etsy.com and search journal, you probably wouldn't find Finding Bee because there's 5,000 other journal makers on there, um, and it is kind of hard to get found. So I use Etsy mainly to direct my customers to buy my things. At shows, all my business cards have my website. I get a lot of orders after shows. Um, I'll do a show in Madison, Wisconsin, and for three or four months, I have a lot of sales that are happening on Etsy from Madison, Wisconsin, because people who <clears throat> buy that day still want to, and so then they can afterwards. Um, okay, the next slide is alternatives to Etsy, and this is just, there. there's a lot of sites that are similar to Etsy. These are some of the most popular ones, or at least the ones that I know about. Um, and you can look up any of these if you're interested in finding a venue to have your own online store, but you just don't like Etsy or it's just not the right market for you. Um, but I would encourage artisans who do, do direct sales to consumers and not just to retailers to really, really consider having a place online that your customers can come to and purchase your work from. Because if not, you leave a lot of money on the table. So the next slide is just the website for Etsy. And then I will take any questions. And if you have a question where you're listening on the phone, just hit star two, and that will uh, raise your hand. And Megan, let me see if we've got a question to coming through the website. Megan, what sort of sales do you have from Etsy is a question from Dick. Um, I, I have sold over 850 items in the last five years on Etsy. Wow, that's a ton. Yeah, and it, like I said, I do send a lot of my own customers there, so it's not necessarily just um, random that people are finding me. It's a lot of people who have seen me somewhere and then find my Etsy store. Right. Anybody with a question on the phone, hit star two. And that's it so far coming through the webcast. And, okay. And, and if there are no more questions, and if some pop up at the end, I'll be here for the whole call. Okay, great. Megan, thank you so much. Julie, I think you're up next. Okay, great. Can you hear me fine? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about Facebook, the changing face of Facebook, in fact. You know, social media presence has really become a necessity for marketing one's business. And with over a billion monthly active users, Facebook is the mother of all social networks. However, as many of us have found out, its effectiveness as a marketing tool and revenue generator requires keeping up with its changing face. And even aggressive marketing through Facebook may not result in the revenue generation that it used to. So why is that? And that's what we're going to explore in this presentation. We're going to gain an understanding of what is under the hood. So be prepared, folks. We're going to get a little technical. But I think this information may be new to many of you, and hopefully it will be helpful. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, the uh, importance of optimizing Facebook posts. You know, when uh, Facebook went public, we began to see many changes with Facebook, and those changes were designed 
primarily to generate revenue for Facebook stockholders. So there was no more free lunch for us, right? Uh, currently, you know, companies can set up a company-specific page on Facebook for free. However, no longer do all those who like that page have its posts show up on their news feeds. And some of you may not know that. Many of us have been sort of shocked and saddened, quite frankly, that that's been the case. So let's go to the next slide again then. Uh, your Facebook posts are actually displayed on only a handful of news feeds. Even if thousands of people have liked your page, your posts will not automatically show up on all of their feeds. And by some estimates, only one in every 500 stories from pages appears in the news feed. So again, sad to say, but there's no more free lunch for us. Let's go to the next slide. Instead, Facebook wants you to purchase promoted posts and ads for your marketing messages and information to reach those who have liked your page and beyond. However, even if you've purchased uh, ads, the fees you pay Facebook will vary depending upon your brand's engagement on Facebook. And Facebook has its own internal ranking or search engine optimization that calculates who's actually going to see your information, and how much purchase uh, post boosts or ads are going to cost. Facebook's, it's called Edge Rank Algorithm, and it's designed to promote high engagement of stories and to make uh, popular content even more popular. Next slide. So your page's Edge Rank score is going to determine how many news feeds Facebook will display your posts on by scoring how valuable your content is by measuring how frequently users visit and interact with your page. The posts with zero likes will get few news feed displays, while ones with many likes will improve your edge rank score, making your posts viral, and therefore more people will see your content. Now, this is really important to understand, folks, that roughly 90% of users never return to a fan page after liking it. So just because you attracted someone once does not mean they will ever even come back to see your comments. Next slide. So it's important to optimize your news feed and uh, to gain engagement and improve your ranking. So to expand your brand's reach and get exposure, uh, you can pay good money to advertise on Facebook, and many do that every day. Uh, you can also optimize, optimize your posts so they improve your ranking, uh, so your ads will cost less. However, the good news is this, that if your posts are extremely optimized and going viral on a regular basis, you may not even need to pay for ads at all. So how do you tell if you're winning at this game? Well, there's no one easy answer, folks, but what you're going to have to do is run some trials and monitor Facebook's insight, it's the, the metrics that they use that will tell you um, what's going on with your post, how many people have viewed, uh, when they viewed, time of day, and et cetera. It's, uh, that in and of itself, quite frankly, could be a topic for another call. And I, I, you know, I think as we start to have some of these conversations and, and dive deep into subjects that some ideas will spring forth for some, some future work we can do together. But for now, let's focus on how we use Facebook to optimize those posts. Let's go to the next slide. So what to post? Well, obviously, um, any events, news, new products, developments in your company, videos and pictures. And it's really important to know what type of content your fans like and optimize your posts for that audience. Okay, next slide. There are three key factors that are going to go into determining your edge rank. And here they are. Uh, the first one is called affinity. And it's the measurement of who views and interacts with your page. It's not about specific posts, but it's an overall measurement about your relationships and shared interests with your network. Higher engagement is going to equal higher affinity scores. The next factor is referred to as weight. 
Different stories are valued differently in terms of edge rank, photos, videos, etc. Weight measures comments, likes, shares, views, and clicks that your posts are getting. So as a post receives engagement, it gets what they call heavier. And the uh, third factor then is time decay. Decay rewards posts that are popular over a duration. So even if a post is a week old and it's continuing to get interaction, get comments, it can actually have a higher rank than something that's just been posted. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here's a free search engine optimization or uh, edge rank boost tip. Share visual content. So very simply stated, a picture is worth a thousand words. We need to make sure our posts are visually appealing. Uh, your message is going to be way more powerful when it's accompanied with an image. And Facebook knows that, that and that is why uh, they've actually paid big bucks for Instagram, which Carrie's going to talk about here in a few minutes, which is one of the most popular photo sharing social media platforms. So photos are guaranteed to get more engagement on your posts. Please make sure you use them. Next slide. Tips for posting. Facebook users log in to find out what is going on with their friends and see funny photos or watch videos. They do not log in to see ads. So be careful about over-promoting in your posts. Uh, no blatant sales pitches. I talked to somebody today who mentioned that they, uh, that they posted something that was, in fact, you know, a direct sales post. They had zero uh, activity on it. But then they posted something silly and had all kinds of comments. Um, so instead, you know, provide helpful information. Try to stay fun where it's appropriate. Be relevant. And again, use images. Next slide. Watch your calendar. So if there's a holiday coming up, post theme content that's relevant to what users are doing. And tie your comment to what's happening now. Be helpful. Solve a problem. Maybe they're looking for something. Okay? We all just come to the holidays. People were looking for all that special gift. So, you know, help them. Help them solve those problems. You also need to track your content. Uh, Facebook provides you with information about how your content was shared in the Insights panel that I mentioned a minute ago. And you're just going to have to learn to uh, spend some time with Insights and use that data to learn what your audiences like. Do they like funny? Do they like photos, videos? And that will help you determine uh, what to post. Next slide. Frequency and timing. So there's really no easy answer here. Uh, effective optimized posts when your users are online and are engaging are more important than frequent posts with little engagement. So that being said, though, there are you know, a, few, uh, a few places to start. Most social media experts recommend that a business have at least four posts a day, no closer than an hour apart. And the best practice, again, I'm going to say it, is to watch your insights, look for clues to effective posting to determine when, uh, you know, what your frequency and the timing of your posts are going to be in order to optimize those and to get the most interaction. Next slide. So what posts get the most engagement? There actually is a content hierarchy. Um, according to research published on Mashable, this is the hierarchy of content, uh, Facebook content based upon engagement from the highest to the lowest. I already mentioned photos, um, and you know we just even talked about photos within, in, uh, with Etsy and with Instagram. Uh, photos are just guaranteed to get you a lot of interaction. So uh, photos are number one on the list. The next is text. However, it's text that calls for engagement or action. Ask a question, does a survey, um, ask them if they like something, ask them to share. The third, which might surprise people a little bit, that it's down a little low on the list because we hear so much about it, is videos. Um, there are different ways to, to present uh, videos on Facebook. And frankly, uh, the most effective way in terms of uh, Facebook's uh, view, is to load your video directly 
to Facebook. But keep in mind, I said a second ago, that a lot of people are coming on and they're wanting to have fun. Videos can take time to look at. If you have a long video in particular, uh, that could end up being a problem for you. So you need to look at what you're doing with videos, make sure technically you're loading them directly into Facebook to get better viewing, describe uh, what people are going to click into when they see it, uh, a video, and keep them um, uh, as short as possible. One to two minutes is, frankly, uh, uh, the limits for effective videos. The last one is links. Now, <clears throat> here's the deal. You know, we all know that uh, clicking on a link sometimes may be uh, opening the door to a virus. So people have become skeptical, a little scared of clicking into a link. If you use a link, have a photo and have a caption uh, to have some engagement, and please describe to folks what they're going to see when they click on the link, and that will help eliminate some of those fears. So the last slide in summary. Facebook has changed, and it's going to change more. Uh, as a result of all of this, it's going to take more effort and, frankly, dollars uh, in order to use it effectively for our, our marketing strategies with our business. However, you know, it does continue to live on as the mother of all social networks and uh, uh, has a huge, huge numbers associated with it. It's going to continue to play an important role as a marketing tool for our business, and it should just be one component of a comprehensive social media marketing strategy. And uh, by using the EdgeRack algorithm, Facebook is going to reward the personalities and the brand marketers that provide the best, most engaging content, and it's going to place it atop the uh, coveted news feed where the multitudes are going to see it. Again, no longer do those who like your page see your comments. So that's why that new speed optimization is going to be uh, just as important today as search engine optimization was a few years ago. Do what you can to post viral, engaging content, and you can actually get access to tens of thousands of news feeds a day for free. And purchase uh, Facebook ads will cost you less because your edge rank is going to, uh, score is going to be higher uh, because of that, that interaction. I actually ran some tests last week where um, I followed some of these suggestions to increase uh, the optimization of some posts, and I followed on insights. And I, uh, without buying an ad, was able to get um, five times the view on some posts that of the uh, number of people who actually had liked my page. So, you know, it can be done, but you've got to understand what Facebook is doing and know how to use it effectively. Are there any questions? Julie? Yes. Hang on just a second. Let me check. Uh, Megan, are you still there? <clears throat> Julie, one? I'm here. I'm still here. I just had my phone muted. Okay. Um, I got questions for both of you. I think this one's for Julie. How can you determine your edge rank? Dick's asking this. Oh well, well it, it's an algorithm and it's secret. You it, you know that just like just like with Google, um, you know all that is under the hood, very secret. You you can you can only tell if you are optimizing by noticing your metrics on uh, on Insight and seeing that your posts are getting liked and shared and people are commenting and interacting. But uh, you will not see your edge rank score anywhere. That's proprietary. Okay. Um, and Dick has another question. I'm kind of working backwards. I have a personal Facebook page. How do I set up a business page? Either one of you want to tackle that? I didn't hear the question. How do you, how do you set up a business page? On Facebook, correct. Yeah. Um, go into Google and uh, enter in and Google and search engine how to set up a, uh, a business page on Facebook. I can tell you really quick if you want me to. Sure, Megan. Yeah, there's a quick way, but I, I'm going to just mention something. There's some, some do's and don'ts and some things that you really want to be careful about. So even though she's going to tell you how, I still advise you to do a little research uh, before you actually do it because there's some things that you want to take great care of when you do because you can't undo certain things once you've done them. 
I, yeah, I totally agree with Julie. Definitely do your research. Um, but I can give you the cheaters quick version if you want to do your research and then also know how to do it. Um, sure, if, you're, if you're logged into your Facebook and you're looking on the top right-hand side, there's a little, um, like a star button, I don't know what you would call it, on the far right-hand side right beside home. If you click on that, it'll give you a drop-down menu. And towards the middle, there's something that says Create Page. And you click on that, and that will walk you through how to do it. I would, I would advise to listen to Julie, though, and, and do some research first just to make sure you, you know exactly what you're doing when you start. And, and YouTube's probably a good resource. You could put uh, start a fan page and probably see a lot of YouTube videos on how to do that, right? Yes. Megan, a couple Etsy questions. Uh, Lydia asks, can Etsy be used as a redirect cover page of sorts that takes a customer to an artisan website to shop? I think they actually have rules against that, because um, I feel like most people who are on Etsy might, might mention their site, but Etsy wants, they want that percentage of your sales, so they want people to shop on your Etsy site. Okay, and then another question from Chaz. Is Etsy okay for doing custom art? What I do is copper repurpose, I may mispronounce that, of a person's picture sent to me. Etsy is excellent for doing custom work. I, I get a very a large percentage of the work that I sell on Etsy is custom. And recently they've made it even easier because there's a button when you have listed, I would list samples of past work that you've done so that you, when you send your clients there, they, they know what they're looking at. And there's a button that on every item, like if you have one listed, a customer can click, make this a custom order, and it will send you a message saying, I want to make this a custom order, and then all their details, and you can set up the transaction from there. Okay, great. Um, Julie, I think this question is for you. How about professional help for optimization? Is it worth it? I think this is Rick from Brown County asking about Edge Rank. Um, that that is really a very personal question because you know I don't really know how to how to advise on that. I don't know you know how much you would have to pay somebody. I don't know what kind of outcome you're expecting or or could expect. Um, I you know I, I I don't really think that there's any one right answer for everybody on this. I think it's a very individual. How much does it mean to you? What goal do you have? that you feel that you can't attain otherwise, and in talking to somebody that could provide some support, do you feel they'll be able to deliver, you know, for your requirements? Okay, great. If there's anybody on the phone that has a question, again, star two to raise your hand, and I can open up your line. I think that's it on the questions for right now. Okay, Louise from New Carlisle. I have a Facebook business page and a personal Facebook page. Can I merge the two? Julie or Megan? I well, Julie, can you take it? Oh, um, well, as having having a, a business page requires that you have an individual page as an administrator. You you don't you don't have to have your personal information out there publicly, uh, but you do have to have. A, a, an individual profile in order to be able to go in and be administrator for um, a public page. Is that everybody else's understanding? Yes. Yeah. And I yeah. highly, highly recommend that artisans have their own, they have a personal one and then they have a separate one for their business. Good answer. And let's see, I think that's it for the online questions and uh, we've got somebody from Chicago with a question on the phone. I've opened up your line. Is it uh, Herbert? Who's ever calling from Chicago? 773 area code. Your line's open. Go ahead and ask your question. The question has been answered. I'm sorry? The question has been answered. Oh, okay. Oh, Great. Oh, thank you. Carrie, if you're on the line, I think you're up next, and okay. we can start with Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. So um, just real quick, hi, everybody. I love you, Julie. Love you, Megan. I've worked beside and learned so much from both of you, and especially tonight. So 
a lot about promoting um, our individual work, I think, and helping to promote others is getting to know the other artisans. So just by all of us being here is kind of fun. Um, Twitter and Instagram and how to use those two vehicles to promote your work um, is kind of interesting. And depending on the season of my business and the growth, because I've only been doing um, handcrafted candies for two years now in Indiana Artisan for one year, is um, I thought I had to be in all of them, like Facebook, Etsy, Twitter, Instagram. And as an artist, um, as you all are doing every aspect of your business, you'll find that there's really only one or two that's going to fit you perfectly that speaks to your customer. So if, if no other message gets across tonight is just reiterating what everyone else has said, is knowing your audience and how to reach them um, well. So I'll just, I'm going to just gloss over Twitter because I used to love it and um, – Surprisingly, immediate quick purchases. Um, Twitter, I found to be, will reach to your male audience more. I'm, I mean, I don't need to apologize. It just is a fact for what I do. And then um, Facebook is more like longer engagement, and you can tell more stories. Twitter is just like a quick fact here and there. So I actually don't use Twitter anymore because I have a low price. Um, handcrafted item right here in Indianapolis and so um, Instagram has become my favorite so all that said I will get started next slide um, promoting social media in general and I know a lot of this has been repeated I'll just do this I'll just say this the way that I wrote it is that I, I've learned from a lot of different marketing type of emails and posts that I've read is that I, I'm very conscious about putting all of my photos and posts and sales type things into three categories, and that is that I will promote the candy industry all, all around, whether it's like a new candy, an old candy, nostalgia, a new item, a new tool. So I promote at least half my posts. I try, try, try to keep within the industry in general, right? Because then you become a chocolate expert, you become a leather expert, wood crafting, um, whatever it is, you become kind of the go-to person in your industry and that will help you probably more than direct sales of your items. And then um, I, I sort of like cringe against really self-promoting stuff, so I try to keep my sales type posts within around 20% of what I do. Um, on the other hand, on Facebook, when Julie's talking about the analytics of your Facebook page, it's uh, once you have a page, you can click on this um, tab called Insights that she's talking about. On the other hand, the self-promoting sales stuff, congratulatory, is that a word, celebratory, um, you know, kind of high-fiving people on your team or customers or yourself, those will have the most engagement. So. You just kind of have to figure out um, how that works for you. And then the third category of what I like to do um, is personal. So it's fun because I've got adorable children. So I can just put them anywhere holding like a chocolate bar and people will, you know, like it all over the place or your pets or whatever. So that's just something to think about when you sit down and you're like, okay, I'm going to do my Facebook today and then it turns out being, and you look at your last 10 posts and it's all sales, you want to just start thinking about your industry in general and then maybe um, maybe putting some personal things out or maybe like a candid of some part of what you're doing that, you know, you're in the factory. You're so close to your item, but it's still good to promote your work by the actual process of what you're doing. Um, oh, and, and really, why all this connection? why all this promoting your work through social media, it really is, and I paid for this advice, by the way, free to you, is that um, you're really trying to create evangelists of your work. So um, I find chocolate is an easy sell. I like to talk about other people's work. I hope you're okay with that, Julie. Um, I, there are a lot of chocolate evangelists already, but Julie's fans are very special because she comes with an entire amazing story about her sourcing her packaging is beautiful. 
So it's, it's great. And candy, too. It's like we have built-in evangelists, but then we can take it a step further by really engaging them into our story and process. And honestly, the three of us, Megan, Julie, and myself, we're really practically available all the time. And so people want to support you. And then as a bonus, our products are amazing. So, and I think that yours are too in, in terms of being part of Indiana Artisan. So that's just something to keep in mind. It's a simple, easy, um, you know, you really have all the internal tools to promote your own work, and these are just other ways to bring it onto social media. So I put this po next slide on Twitter. I put this post up there. Read it later if you even want to. It's just super current. Um, New York Times did a study about all of their Twitter posts in 2013, keeping in mind that they are a news site. It was just interesting. Um, some of the things that they found worked well and what didn't, and it's so easy because you know your work so intimately, it's, it would be so easy to apply this towards a handcrafted product. Next slide. Um, some of the highlights that I learned um, that I just wrote like a little quick thing after it is if you, in your community, in your city or town in Indiana, if you have a news story run on you at all, make sure um, anytime a journalist puts it up, you know, within Twitter, and you'll, you'll just jot down some of these terms, and like Julie said, you can Google any of this of how to get started. Be sure that you really engage with that journalist, whether it's replying, favoriting, retweeting. These might be new words to you. But every which way, even if it feels like you're stalking them down, you just tell them how thankful you are and letting them sort of become an evangelist of yours through them just being excited about your work or, you know, what, what new things you have going on. That is just a great way because it's someone else saying it and they've got their own set following. And that's just would be a very helpful tool in promoting your work. Um, and then we've talked about having discussions, scheduling. Um, oh. The, next, the third bullet down, and you can do this on Facebook, Twitter, and then, or you can just, if you're just a calendar kind of person, just put reminders in your calendar. Okay, today, post this. You know, and you can even become pretty, um, pretty specific about it. You know, put a personal post today. Put a, put a candid in work post today. Over time, this becomes really natural, and you're like, okay chill out, Carrie, on the post of your customers. You know, nobody wants to see these people anymore. And then they just want to know maybe something new that you're working on. So anyway, I'm going to skip over the next few because it's specific to Twitter, which I'm not using as much. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Um, it's just not something that I can speak real detailed about. But you can come back to this and look at it. Um, the last one's kind of fun. I don't know if um, Julie or Megan, I'm sure it's happened to Julie for sure, is that sometimes on Twitter you can reach um, heavyweights within your industry. Like, say, for me, it might be like a celebrity pastry chef or something, restaurant owner. Heavyweight within your town, within your city, within your state, or the whole country. And they might just, like, engage with you. They might retweet you. They might reply to you. And a lot of the reason is because you've worked so hard and being – up to date within your industry, you really do know what you're talking about. So if you said something on Twitter, these are people you never, ever, ever would have an interaction with because how would they have found your Facebook? You wouldn't be personal friends with them. And that um, you may not be able to engage with them on Instagram necessarily. But Twitter is a really fast way to heavyweights within your industry because um, you might just catch them off on an off moment. They see it. They reply or retweet. And the reason, more than just like a really great feeling that it has just for you, is they come with a giant following, and they might start favoriting or retweeting, just bringing a little more promotion to your work. Okay. Next slide. Um, I just took a snapshot, I hope it's okay, of the Indiana Artisan um, Twitter page. So this is just kind of what it looks like. It looks a little bit overwhelming. But we all started with post number one and following one person, and you certainly can get there. Um, associating yourself with this um, organization, with Indian Artisan, they already have 1,400 followers. So the more you associate yourself within your, um, uh, I don't want to say organizations, but other memberships and other things that you're involved with, um, again, they bring the following and 
perhaps they'll show some love your way. Next slide, Instagram, my fave, but I'll, I'll keep it short, is just today when we get off the phone, tomorrow, open up your Facebook business page. Just say you're going to do it. If it's too overwhelming for you, I swear within one degree of separation, there's someone who's willing to do it for you. Instagram, if you have a data phone, it is the simplest thing. Take a picture and post it to Instagram. Start following people. They'll follow you back. Um, like Julie said, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. I just find it is the easiest to use at a glance. All your pictures are tiled. It's really simple for me to see, am I selling this item? Am I posting too much about my family or a dog or the kids? Um, or, you know, and it's another way to engage within your industry. And, you know, all these are free social networking sites. So you'll just have to think more about your client and which one works best for you. If your best friend is willing to do some of this for you for free, just use what they use. I mean, right? I mean, you don't have to tell them, and then they'll just start posting some stuff for you. So that's just kind of um, some advice on that. Um, and then, again, later, go back to these slides. I attached a post from Small Business Trends um, in some interesting ways that they use Instagram. Sneak previews on products, which I know Julie had mentioned, staying very true to your brand. If you are, um, you know, I'm nostalgia, so I'm almost craft papered out. I'm so like that wood color, my products wood. So I'm, I'm starting to get away from that on my brand. But my brand is I use food colors. I like, um, you know, natural. I like peanut colored things, of course, because I have a peanut butter candy. And so every decision I make with every photo, with every posting is typically somewhere in there. Um, and then I think we talked about this, maybe not, about call to action. It's oh, totally okay to ga engage with your customers in a way, um, hey, I saw the, you know, um, I'm thinking, I, I just love kitchen utensils. So if you make like a handcrafted kitchen utensil, like a spoon, and you're working on like a prototype, just take pictures of all five and just say like, hey, which one do you guys like best? And, that's, and then you walk away from it, and then you go back to your craft. And what's amazing, when you come back, there's like 10 messages waiting for you. So that's kind of a neat feeling. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, next slide. This is it's just one type of view of Instagram. This is the kind that you get from your um, desktop or laptop. It looks a little bit different on your phone. But um, I just grabbed this. And so... Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven photos, and none of them have to do with candy. This was just this was during that snowstorm, so I was just dying to reach out to one human being. So I just you know there's a couple of personal things in there, but if you notice, they all relate to food. It's not only my passion, but it is definitely my industry. They're all they're all food photos. And then my last slide um, is some bonus info. If you go. Um, just promise yourself you're going to do this in the next three business days, is go to I, – I do think you have to create a um, Gmail account. But go to the thing called Google Alerts if you don't already do it, and just put up like four or five alerts, sign up for daily notification. But um, put your name in there, unless you're John Smith. Maybe don't because you'll get all kinds of alerts. Maybe put something interesting about your industry. Like I could do an alert on um, – I don't want to do candy, it's too broad, but maybe I could do an alert for nostalgia candy in quotations. It will only, the alert will be in the form of an email, and I will only get, it'll say like top 10 emails, excuse me, posts within the last one day where people have posted something on the internet using the words nostalgia and candy together, if you put the quotation marks, or Carrie Abbott in quotation marks, or Megan Wynn in quotation marks, Binding B. Um, so just some example alerts would be maybe your name, your industry, your company name. And if you really want to go there and you want to spend this kind of time on watching your competition, um, you could just kind of be kept up, up to date on your competition or maybe people or products that inspire you. And then lastly, you can do this later, is just click on that little short video. I think it just came out. No, I actually Googled this one. I forgot. But I love Marie, um, Marie Forleo. She's just a little five-minute inspiration per week. 
Um, but she did a great one about four ways to be on social media without overwhelming. So just real quick, there you don't have to do it. I mean, you're here now. It's a quick, easy way to just kind of look at it, but you can actually decide not to do it when you do it when you're ready. Less is more. Get organized. Make a schedule. We were talking about earlier, you know, maybe today you're going to do a personal post. Maybe in a couple of days you'll do one business-related. Um, in the holiday season, because I have a gift candy, it was exactly what Julie said. I mean, I was up to four a day, and it felt like a lot for me. But I had to get organized and create a schedule for that. Um, and then lastly, is just remember that every time you're posting to social media ever, there are ways to undo it. Um, you can give your opinion, but maybe keep it positive, because everything that you put out there could sort of come back as a liability. And that is all I have, and beyond this, if you ever um, just want to reach out, because I do love marketing, social media, I love products, naturally I love food. Um, a couple of you actually have called me before about packaging and sourcing and stuff, and I just, I love that. And if I can share and help grow your business, I want to do that too. And that's all I have. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you have this is Julie, can you hear, can, this is Julie, can you hear me real quick? Yeah. Okay, one, one uh, I know Carrie was uh, mentioned the bonus on a, a Google alert, and thank you for that, Carrie. That just reminded me I had an alert I needed to set up and just did it. Uh, one, awesome. other little, one little bonus from Julie is uh, hashtags. We didn't get into that tonight, but uh, you can have very effective interaction with uh, Facebook, with Twitter, and with Instagram, Instagram. Uh, if you are really smart and know how to use hashtags. And uh, I would suggest for those of you who'd like some more information about that to just go on to Google and uh, enter in how to use hashtags, and you'll just get all kinds of information. Yeah, that's right, on the hashtags. Yep. yep. And, yeah, I Google is so good for all that. Just Google everything that we've talked about, and then you'll get – You'll get some more in-depth how-tos. Julie, did you talk about how to schedule posts? I might have missed that if you did. No, I, no, I didn't get into scheduling posts because I didn't really get into all of the weeds about uh, about using Facebook. But, yeah, you want to go ahead and mention yeah, that? Yeah, I'll give you a tip because I'm one that I get a little overwhelmed with social media, so I have to do the scheduling thing, and I also – it, it, it distracts me, like I get too distracted if I get on four times a day to do the post. So there's this awesome thing on Facebook where in your business page, and again, you can Google this too, but when you're making a listing, there's a little button that has a clock on it, and you can click that, and it'll schedule your post for you. So I can go in and get a whole, you know, two or three days worth of social media posts up on so I know they're going to be delivered on time, and then I can just kind of poke in when I want to interact with people or thank them for liking something or ask a question. Um, but that way they're at least scheduled, and I don't have to remember every four hours to get on and post something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add on to that, too. There are also tools out there that will allow you to do the scheduling that will schedule on more than one social media. So, for instance, TweetDeck is one that you can use, and you can schedule with it, and you can schedule a uh, post that will go out on Facebook uh, and or Twitter. And you know what I think I might do? This is, this is Eric. I, I think there is so much here that it might yeah. be smart to break uh, these additional topics into additional webinars and just drill down on, on specific topics for maybe a half an hour webinar in the future. Uh, because yeah. some of this stuff is, is new to me, and I, I think we could use it for Indiana artisans. So why don't the three of us or the four of us get together, and I'm sure there's others out there with expertise in this, and we can create a little uh, you know, maybe just a technology series for half an hour webinars that uh, drill down just on specific topics. Uh, Jeff, do you care if I just kind of butt in here before we go to the, the big broad questions and answers and, and to do a little cleanup? No, not, not at all. We've got three questions um, online that I've got whenever you're ready, and then uh, you, you tell me and we can open up the lines again. Okay. Well, well, first, Megan, Julie, Carrie, thanks so much. This, this was great information. At, at times it almost felt like we were getting hit with a fire hose. Uh, it was coming so fast, but, but it, it was great, and I kept sitting here making notes, and 
more and more and more, I thought, you know, we need to break this into uh, more easily chewable bites. And, and thanks for doing this. This, this was really a, a worthwhile webinar tonight. Uh, what I wanted to do, though, is, is jump in here and do a promo for the Bruce Baker webinar. I sent everybody, all of the artisans last night, an email that had a one-page attachment that promotes the workshop, which is two weeks from today. Uh, the registration deadline is the 24th, and I encourage you to read that one pager and register because Bruce will help you expand your business through increased sales. Uh, a couple dozen artisans over the last couple of years have participated in his workshops, and to be honest, they finally wore me down. He, he is considered to be the speaker in the U.S. in terms of helping artisans, uh, artists, and foodists learn the sales process and how to be successful at it, and we're really lucky to have him come to Indiana for us. But the registrations are not coming in like I anticipated, and so I wanted to just, just do a little promo. Uh, unlike any other sales-related seminar you may have attended, he does not talk broadly about sales and leave you to translate how it applies to selling your work. Bruce talks only about selling art, and he and I have talked, and he said uh, selling art and value-added food sales are so similar that the workshop on the 28th will be just as valuable for the foodists that are Indiana artisans. And I want to shift gears just a little bit, still on the same theme. We all want the marketplace to become the annual showcase of Indiana's best arts and foods. And if we're going to accomplish that, a lot more of Indiana's best artists and foodists, and that's you, need to participate. I ask those who don't participate why they say things like, it's a craft market, my work is fine art, or I tried it once and I didn't do well. Uh, others say, you know, I don't do shows, or I've never been able to make shows work for me. Uh, some say it's too time consuming or too expensive. There are a lot of responses, and it seems to me like all of them can be addressed by helping artisans understand the sales process and how to work through that naturally in, in a comfortable way for them. Uh, with that, they can make money, and, and they can do that, and all these issues go away. Uh, the marketplace puts our artisan family in front of at least 5,000 people, and educated well, you can make the most of that opportunity and generate good sales and revenue. You, you don't have to morph into some pushy or aggressive salesperson, and it seems a lot of artisans view strong sales with having to have a strong personality, and that, that, that's not the case. To, to bring this back to Bruce, he, he talks about the entire sales cycle from promotion to setting up and engaging booths to engage with potential customers and having them come into the booth. Uh, he talks about icebreakers, making the sale, increasing sales. Uh, somebody comes in and, and wants to buy one thing, how you can talk about other things that you offer and increase the number of sales with one customer. Uh, he covers closing the sale and, and following up afterwards. If this process or, or any of the steps are hanging you up, and, and I know they're hanging up at least half of you, you should attend this workshop. It's why we're bringing him to Indiana to speak. The investment in your business will be $10 an hour. He, he's coming in on the 28th for a day-long, seven-hour workshop, and the cost is $70, and that includes your lunch. I'm um, hoping you see the value in what he can help to learn and attend on the 28th. We, we talk a lot about Indiana artisan helping artists and foodists expand their business and expand their businesses and helping those who have day jobs uh, reach a point where they can quit those and pursue their art or passion full-time, and this workshop will go a long way to helping you accomplish that. Uh, to wrap it up, the link to register is on the website. It's very easy to find. If you just go to indianaartisan.org, right there on the front page, it'll take you to the page where you can register. And registration is really nothing more than an email that tees up to me, and I will respond to you with more information. So Bruce Baker, two weeks from today, uh, if you haven't registered, please think about it. For $10 an hour, it, it's worth the investment in your business. So that's my commercial. Jeff, do you want to just take it away and, and read the questions and let the panel respond to those? Sure. Uh, one of them says, would anybody be willing to do a webinar on Pinterest? Um, so ah. I guess you could throw that in into the mix. Um, and I emailed these to you, Eric, and I'll, I'll start at the bottom. If you see them and you want to pick up, that's fine. Uh, Jenny from Zionsville says, just a comment. I found a gallery in Pennsylvania that now carries my work via Twitter. Probably would have never made that contact otherwise. So you can use it to find things, shows, and people, too, not just for customers to find you. Um, Lydia from Fort Wayne says, I don't want to do social media, but I want my friends and customers to pin me or tweet about me or Facebook my work, et cetera. How does one handle that? Mm. Well, uh, this is Carrie. So how – so this is Lydia. Is that right? Um, I'm thinking, is she – at an event, 
are you at an event? And then right then you want people to engage. Because um, Twitter is kind of like five minutes and then it, the moment's over. So um, to I, I'm not as familiar with Pinterest. Maybe Megan can speak to that. Um, I have found other people have taken pictures of the product and then other people will pin it, which is amazing. But to create that immediate um, following or engagement, I would definitely use Facebook or sometimes you have to really go for the full, I mean, actual on the moment ask. Um, hey, I just met you. I love your work. Um, you know, where can I tweet about you? Well, I mean, I guess I don't know if they would ask that specifically. You would just say, here's my Twitter account. Let's pull up your phone. Let's take a picture together right now. And then, then it's done. And then you move them on, and then, you know, you're talking to another customer. But that's the way I have found Twitter to work, is you are, like, in the moment right then, and they're so excited about your work. And the fact that you would take a picture with them and put it up right now, or you would talk about meeting them on Twitter, will make their day, will make their week, month, whatever. So that's what I would say. This is Julie. I wanted to add, uh, Twitter, I think, has uh, been most effective for me when we've actually been in an event and people that are at that event, if they're using Twitter, you can uh, do some special things with Twitter during an event to bring people to you. Another question, um, this is Jenny from Zionsville, uh, about Twitter, interact with your followers, reply to their comments to you. Nothing worse than following businesses that only post stuff and never, re never respond to anything directly. I unfollow if I see no responses to anyone's comments. Right. I would say depending on how big the business is. See, we're all handicrafts and we're all doing it um, beginning to end and then we're going out there and selling it. I mean, unless I'm misunderstanding the artisan program, I really think that. So we are all in a high engagement product-related item. So it depends on the company that you're talking about. They may just be too big to do that. Um, and I totally understand, because you would do that for your customer. Why wouldn't they? Um, it's just, yeah, I mean, you might do that. And if nothing else, it says you better favorite, retweet, reply, um, like over engage almost with your um, customer. Now I did, side note, I did run a contest a couple times and I did run into like a customer vendor type of relationship with um, one individual that it just got just weird. So you just, I guess there is, a, there could be a little bit over engagement. <laughs> and, and maybe the simple question to Lydia's comment about I don't want to do yeah. social media but but she wants to you know customers to pin and tweet you can probably hire somebody to, to do that if you've got the money I mean right. yeah but we're all also here for free help so I agree I yeah you could get someone to do it and I really mean that um, if you have a niece or nephew or a grandchild or a sister brother and they are just like never off their phone and or they're just sort of offering I would just let them do it I mean, I really would. And so, um, yeah, to not allow yourself over, to get overwhelmed, absolutely. If you can hire it out two, three hours a week, you know, that would be wonderful. Or even a month, you know, just like Megan and Julie said, scheduling your posts out. And, again, if anybody is on the phone and you have a question, just hit star 2, and that will um, raise your hand. Uh, there is one more comment on the questions from online. Diane from Greenwood says, I second the idea about Pinterest. And then somebody else just chimed in. Did Megan say that she would be willing to do a webinar on Pinterest? Megan, I didn't hear that. Is that what you said or no? Well, I said there needs to be a webinar on Pinterest, but I can I can help with that for sure. Great. I don't see anybody raising their hand, Eric, and I think we've gone through all the questions. Again, to enter a question online, just uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, type it into the Submit Your Question box and click Submit. I'll keep checking if you want to go forward with uh, the rest of the program. Okay. We, we've just uh, we we've just about uh, filled out our time anyway. Let me, uh, while you're all still on the line, promote next week's webinar. As you know, we're doing these on Tuesday nights at 730 Eastern. 
Uh, next Tuesday night on January the 21st, we have a panel of five people talking on booth design and pricing to maximize your booth traffic and sales. Uh, the speakers are Tom Winsack, Carrie Strange, Tasha Johnson St. Clair, and Greg Adams, who have all won Best in Show booth awards at the Marketplace, and also Amy Greeley, uh, who over the, all of the three marketplaces that we've had so far has consistently grossed among the top three artisans. Uh, at least a couple of those years, she was she was number one, the highest grossing artist, and she has a, a beautiful booth. She merchandises her jewelry very well, uh, and she knows how to draw customers in, and she's going to talk about that. So next Tuesday night, 7.30 Eastern, uh, dial back in. I'll send you an email reminder, uh, probably Sunday or maybe Monday, uh, with the number to dial and the, the link to uh, click to uh, participate in that. It'll be another good one. Uh, their slides are already together, and I've seen those, and they, they do look sharp. Um, again, Megan, Julie Carey, thanks so much. And Jeff Bell, thank you for making this webinar technology available to us. Uh, Jeff, as you all know, is Indian artist and Carol Bell's husband. And, and Jeff, thanks so much for staying late in the office and, and hosting this series. Uh, I, I did see one other question come in, and it was about uh, posting these webinars online. And Jeff does record the webinars, and he uploads them to YouTube for us. And I put the links on the Indian Artisan website. So if you dialed in late or if you want to go back and catch a couple points you missed, you can do that. Uh, the video, by the way, lets you skip right to the parts that you want. You don't have to start at the beginning and, and listen for an hour to, to catch one thing that maybe Megan said and you missed. But you can scoot and, and go right to, to Megan or to Julie or to Carrie's part. So uh, that will probably happen tomorrow. Uh, look on the Indian Artisan website. The links will be easy to find. That's really all I have. Jeff, do we have more questions? No, I think that's it. Uh, we answered them all, I think, tonight. All right. Everybody, yeah. thanks for dialing in. And again, Megan, Julie, Carrie, thanks for your time. And uh, I, I know these take hours to prep for, and I, I appreciate you giving all of us that kind of time. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us.